Welcome to the Accounting Success Podcast. Ian Wellam is a chartered accountant, helping other CPA firms maximize their profit potential and become the most relevant advisor to clients. To learn how you can add value, introduce new revenue streams, and move into high-value advisory services, simply go to www.haydenrock.com. On the podcast, Ian brings together successful accountants and industry thought leaders to share with you how they serve business owners and how you can too. And now, here's your host, Ian Wellam. Hello, and welcome to the Accounting Success Podcast. With me on the call today is Chris Billman, Senior Tax Manager at Logan Valenti Bookbinder and Wine Truck in Amherst, New York, outside of Buffalo. Previous to joining LVBW, Chris accumulated over 20 years of experience in both public accounting and private industry, nearly nine years as a tax director for an SEC-registered international IT services company, and 12 years in public accounting, including nine years with a big four national accounting firm. With his broad experience in both private and public accounting, Chris brings value to a variety of industries and business clients. LVBW is a full-service accounting firm that specializes in accounting, tax, and consulting services to privately owned businesses. The firm's mission is to help clients succeed by gaining an in-depth knowledge of their business through the personal involvement of the partners. Their proactive team-based approach to serving clients distinguishes them from other accounting firms. Firm specialities include audit, tax, and business consulting industry expertise includes real estate development, construction, manufacturing, retail wholesale distribution, medical practices, service organizations, and not-for-profit. LVBW is also a member of BDO Alliance Network. This allows them the unique ability to provide clients with the resources of a major national firm as well as the personal attention of a local independent. So this gives me great pleasure to welcome Chris Billman to the podcast. Welcome, Chris. Thank you for spending some time with us this morning. Oh, Thank you, Ian. It's a pleasure to join you. Chris, your firm is ahead of the pack in providing proactive, value-added services to business clients, and I'm really looking forward to exploring that with you today. But let's start with you personally. Can you share with the listeners a bit about your background? What was your path into accounting? Uh, What inspired you to be a CPA? You know, I probably have kind of a unique uh, path to where I am today. Um, I actually started in college as an engineering major. And I had always gravitated towards the math and science side of things. And then after a couple of years in, of engineering, I just found myself more gravitating towards the math side of things. And with talking with some professors, I made the switch to, uh, to business and, and then with a focus on eventually focused you know, particularly on accounting, and graduated with my with my bachelor's in accounting at that point. And that was uh, 1993. After after college, I worked with a midsize uh, local firm up in upstate New York here, um, which that was about. I did that for about five years, and the nice thing about that that's always helped me looking back on it is, with a firm that size, oftentimes you you would go out and do the the audit or the compilation or review at the client, come back, do the financials, and then do the tax return. So I kind of got to see the whole A to Z for the client, which helped me immensely going forward, like being able to understand what the auditors do and being able to, uh, you know, read a financial statement intelligently, et cetera. Um, After about five years, I had a chance to uh, move on to a position with one of the big four, and it was a a great experience. Um, You know, you really can't replace that experience with with anything and it's something that you almost need to to do to understand it it's a it's a lifestyle i would say at, at points and I, I got to the point where i was a senior manager there and you know looking at do i want to go partner track at the same time i was getting married and thinking about having kids and for me personally those those the idea of being a a partner with an international firm and having 
a family and spending time with the the family and kids really didn't really didn't fit together for me. So yeah. I decided to look at other opportunities and I had a a great opportunity came along to be the I was the worldwide tax director for a publicly traded company based here in Buffalo, about a $400 million company with uh, international operations, operations in all 50 states, and we did everything in-house. Uh, all the compliance work, all the consulting, the research, everything was done in-house. Uh, along with the SEC reporting and everything, and we were we were actually just a two man shop, if you can believe that, for a company of that size. Um, so that was again just I learned so much about being on the other side of the accounting side. You know, uh, now I'm now I'm the client, and I I know what the auditors are looking for and and what I need from the auditors, et cetera. Um, the company kind of changed direction, you know, so I started looking at other opportunities. The, the last thing on my mind was going back into public accounting. Uh, who goes back into public accounting after being out for about a decade? Um, but I got convinced to take an interview with, uh, with LVBW here, and the interview was great. I mean, the people that I met, the partners and the senior managers had a really unique view, I thought, on how to service their clients. At the same time, they were going through their own succession planning. So it was an opportunity for me to actually step into a, uh, a book of business for one of the retiring partners and be a key part of the succession plan going forward. So that was – great opportunity and, I, and as you mentioned we're a part of the BDO Alliance so I had the opportunity to have that huge network behind me like I did back when I was in the big four of the expertise in a different country or a different state or somebody that does let's say a high level M&A work day in day out so we have access to those resources, but at the same time, we manage, you know, we're managed locally and without all the politics of a big international firm. So that was about 18 months ago, and it's been great ever since. So you have experience from both sides of the table. Exactly. I assume that has to help when dealing with business owners. It, it absolutely does because um, I've felt the pain from the other side and I know how fee sensitive um, businesses can be um, and part of overcoming that fee sensitivity is feeling like your accountant brought value to the table and um, I, I feel like I, having been on both sides of the table now, I, I think I, I can relate to that, and it makes those conversations easier when we're talking with a client or a potential client about what we can do for them. Yeah, I mean, you, may, you mentioned clients being be sensitive, um, but if they see the value, um, that becomes less of a problem. So how do you, how do you charge? Do you value based billing, or uh, what kind of uh, how do you deal with the clients uh, for billing purposes? You know, the majority of our clients at this point are still really really uh, hourly billed. Um, we are moving our focus into more of a value based um, approach for certain services. Um, some of our outsourced accounting services and things like that where it's more of a fixed fee you know on a monthly basis the the firm historically as most accounting firms have, you know it, it's all about the timesheet um, I swore I would never do a timesheet when I left uh, a public accounting a decade ago but I, I'm back doing a timesheet um, you know and that's a, that's a, a frame of mind that I think is kind of ingrained in old school accountants and it's hard to get away from that and but it's it's something that I think the industry needs to do going forward. 
And and how how might would you compare what you do today versus what your activities were when you were working for a big four firm? The the thing I like about what I do today is I I feel like I can really make a difference with our clients. Um, I'm not one piece of the puzzle in a huge team that services the client, I might be the main contact and I have access to the CEO, the business owner, and they, if, if, it's more about a relationship base now than it was at, uh, at the big four because I have more access to the client and so much of accounting now is is building that relationship and that trust with the client that that you're going to bring value to the table. I think some of our some of our uh, industries almost become a commodity where people are competing for I'll do your tax return cheaper than than the other guy and 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 that's a tough space to compete in. Um, I'm not sure we even want to compete in that particular space, you know. Um, so I I like that I have more access directly to the client and um, feel like I can make a difference with a phone call and and provide advice or, by the same token, have that business owner call me looking for advice. So, how uh, how often? say for a, a client that you're fairly heavily involved in, how often will you meet with that client or speak to that client, uh, business owner client? Well, some of the, I, I think traditionally people looked at their, have looked at their accountants as the guy who came out once a year and maybe cleaned up the books and, and did the tax return and then it turned into, you know, see you next year. And we try not to take that approach with our clients. Um, we, the, the clients that we work with on like an outsourcing basis, um, we typically have somebody, say, doing the bookkeeping or the internal accounting work um, on a regular basis, producing financials that on a monthly basis, either like one of the partners takes some time and reviews those financials and maybe discusses them with the client if there's anything that they'd like to point out. At a minimum, probably a, a quarterly face-to-face -face meeting. Probably, it depends on probably the life cycle of the relationship and how good the internal reporting, you know, if management understands their internal reporting, um, they might be able to go, you know, a little more time without having that face to face. But if they want to meet monthly, we're more than happy to meet monthly, and that's just part of the package pricing. Yes, uh, I, I think you mentioned how important relationships are, and I, uh, of course, regular involvement with the business owner builds that relationship, and also I, I would imagine it opens the door to even more uh, advisory services, more a, a, broader, um, a, a broader range of services. Uh, now, you mentioned oh. what you liked about L LVBW was that they were unique. What would you say the one thing that makes them different from the other CPA firms? You know, I, one of the things that we take a lot of pride in is that we take the time to step back and meet with the client and understand what part of the business life cycle, if you will, that they're in. Are they a startup? Are they in growth mode? Are they maintaining, you know, steady, just steady business? Or are they looking at a succession plan or an exit strategy? And that comes from talking with the client and understanding what they're thinking and also taking that next step in if they're in the growth stage we need them to start thinking about the stage where they're maintaining or the stage where they are 
going to exit. Not a lot of people like to think about exit succession planning because your business owners might be your type A personalities that you know don't like to think about oh, what would I do if I wasn't working. But exit strategy is is so important, um, and you can't just do it. You can't do it properly, I should say, on the spur of the moment. You really need to look at it a few years down the line and prepare the company to exit. I have a strategy in place for, okay, what are you going to do with the proceeds of this exit strategy and managing them in the post-business life cycle as well. So we'd like to take like a very holistic view of the company and understand it and um, being able to bring ideas, consulting ideas, or just uh, tax saving ideas, whatever that they may be, and bring them to the client proactively. I think accounting historically has been a reactive uh, industry where we deal with a problem once it comes up and we try to identify those problems before they become problems and stop them. In, in their tracks before we get too far. So yeah, I, I think, think yes, yeah, so I think we're singing from the same song sheet with respect to what we consider to be uh, helping the client find where they want to go and ultimately what that exit strategy might be um, and get ahead of that curve and be proactive in helping them get there to wherever that place happens to be. Uh, exactly. I think that, that definitely sets uh, your firm apart if that's an approach that you use. Um, it, it is, and we also use what we call like a identifying a, a gap strategy for the for the client, which we we sit down with them and talk about basically help them identify, work with them to identify the three to five items that are most important to their business and then identify what is impeding the progress in getting to those three to five items. And then we develop what we call a gap plan to close the gap between where they are and where they want to be. And yeah. that's something that is simple, but with checkpoints along the way and allows them to focus on what they do best, the business side, while we can focus on what we do best and work with them and bring ideas to the table when they're necessary. That's a, that's a great uh, approach. And I suspect that that conversation, that, that, that approach, will actually require you to ask some uh, or have some kind of diagnostic, diagnostic methodology because often a business owner or business owners, they don't necessarily know what's holding up their business or maybe you're able to uncover elements which they only being, if you will, an outsider looking in, are you able to objectively see? Uh, certainly that, that seems to me that that's an added bonus, having somebody who isn't sitting in the business day to day looking at it. Completely agree. Um, you know, it, it, as you said, it, it's, it's that second set of eyes where we're not in the weeds like the business owner or the business drivers might be, and we can step back and say, wow, your, your gross profit percentage compared to your industry is, is really low, you know, or, okay, your numbers look okay, but you, I don't, are you taking a salary? <laughs> you know, and you really need to, for them to step back and, and, and look at it from an outsider's perspective. And yeah, and that's that's difficult for some to do, but we try to get them there. Chris, uh, uh, I actually speak to many many CPAs, and I look at a lot of CPAs' websites. One of the things that gives me a feel for a firm is to read client testimonials, and I've got to be honest, most of them say something like, you know, Harry's a great guy and provides accurate financial statements um, and and of the ilk. But yours are, are quite different. And, and if you'll permit me, I'd like to read a few. No, absolutely. We consider Logan Valenti, Bookbinder, and Weintrop to be more of a business partner than a CPA firm. 
Working with them is one of the best decisions this organization has ever made. I consider them to be more than our accounting firm. They are an integral part of our team. And the last one, whether it's investigating a new business venture or managing an existing one, their number is the first one we call. Now, that, this doesn't sound like a typical accounting firm. No, and I, I appreciate you reading those. So, I mean, those are very, very complimentary, and we appreciate that kind of feedback from our clients. But, I mean, that is what we're, we're shooting for, is to not be your, you know, stop by once a year and see you next year accounting firm. We want to be a partner with you. And help you understand your business and help you grow that business or take you to the next step, whatever that may be for you. And we take that very personally. Um, we have very close relationships with the clients that we work with, which I think is kind of unavoidable because we, we, uh, you know, we're so involved in their business and in their, which oftentimes with a closely held or family owned business, you know, ties in quite closely with their personal finances. So it's been, uh, yeah, it gives us a, a great opportunity to really get to know somebody and uh, take it to the next step beyond what uh, historically their accounting firm has brought to the table. And how do you articulate to new prospective clients um, your points of difference? Um, you know, we try to explain that their account, tax, in a, tax services and audit or assurance services, those are always a core part of any accounting relationship, but they shouldn't be the, the, the complete extent of it. There's so much more that your accountant should be than just the guy who prepares your tax return or comes out and audits your books. Um, we try to take it to the next level and have them understand, okay, has your – try to talk about what we would do for them rather than downplay or, any, or criticize what their current ac accountant is doing. We'll ask sure. them – Questions such as, have you, you know, what's your exit strategy? You know, uh, your sales dropped off over the last two years. Have you thought? Have you taken a look at why that is? You know, so get them, ask them probing questions to get them talking, to get them to tell us their pain points, um, and they quickly realize, oftentimes, that their current accountant doesn't do that. Yeah. And you know, they quickly realize that, okay, why are they asking me something that they've known me for 30 minutes and my, my accountant for the last decade has never asked me any questions like this. Yes. And that's kind of a quick, uh, we kind of say give us 30 minutes and we'll, we'll, we'll show you the difference. Now, and when a client hard. looks like a good fit, uh, both from their side and from your side, do you have a specific onboarding process to maximize the benefit you can bring as soon as possible? Well, I, I think we would step back and look at what what the the most important thing is in the short term, and that might be that they their internal accounting hasn't been up to snuff, and they say they, they're unable to get accurate or timely financial reporting to see how their business is doing on a, on a real-time basis. So that might be the first and foremost thing that we get in and fix that issue so that they can have reliable reporting to measure how they're performing, whether it be on a job basis or on an overall basis or a year over year. So many times we find that they, the, the, really, the information they receive internally is either unreliable or just plain inaccurate. So that might be, if that's the case, that's the first priority is getting everything 
up to date and correct. And then going forward, you know, we we have those discussions about where are you today, where do you want to be, you know, and and going into that gap strategy that we talked about earlier. So for many clients, uh, a quick win is actually to show them truly how they're performing uh, by providing that that uh, accurate information. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. My, my experience is though that clients often have reasonable management accounts, but they don't have any uh, reports or other analysis to help them run their business. Is that something that you work with them to, to generate? Absolutely. We find that, we find that so many um, businesses in our target market, which is anywhere from like the five to $150 million range generally, so many of them don't do budgets and as an accountant, it, it, it is hard to understand how you manage your business without a proper budget and knowing how you're performing against budget or without doing any sort of job costing and knowing that job was profitable, this job I lost money on. Instead, they just tend to manage sometimes by what's in the bank or just by their gut. And that, that can, that's not going to lead anywhere good. <laughs> yeah. You know. Yeah. No, I, I completely agree. Now, I think I counted over a dozen different consulting or advisory services on your masthead, from business valuation to succession planning, as we just mentioned, to cost segregation. Perhaps you could give us an idea of how the firm decided to go down this road. Uh, was it clients asking for this, or was it a recognition internally that this, this was something that should be provided? You know, I think it was a little bit of both. We had we knew there was a need. If you're going to work with closely held, family held businesses, there's a need when you are looking at exit planning, there's of course a need for valuation. So we needed valuation expertise. Um, cost segregation, for example, is just something that is, you know, we have so many clients that purchase a new building and you can save really, you know, cost seg is an easy way to save a client a lot of money in the short term by accelerating, you know, deductions. Um, some of them, though, have also been seeing, stepping back and looking at the market and seeing, okay, here's how the market's changing. We need to ramp up our expertise in estate planning and succession planning. And um, so we have partners who specialize in wealth management and estate planning and, um, you know, all the, all, as the firm has gone through the years, you see the touch points that, that your clients need assistance with. And I think that's where we've tried to develop our expertise. Now, I understand that you even provide client guidance for life insurance and health insurance, retirement savings plans. I think you were just touching on some of those other, other advisory services. How did you pick these services specifically? And perhaps more generally, um, how do you decide which services to, to offer to a client? You know, I think it's part of that initial, um, if it's a new client, it's part of that initial getting to know the client, where are the pain points, and where, where do they need additional assistance, and what has their prior accountant not brought to the board uh, as far as ways to save tax money or ways to improve their business or just a different way to look at their business. Um, if it's an existing client, because we're usually so involved with their day-to-day -day operations and we have close relationships with the business owners and the, you know, the, the decision makers, we're often, you know, clued right in to, okay, this is coming down the pipe so-and-so is exiting, so we need to talk about how they're going to fund a stock buyout for that person who's retiring. 
So, you know, it, part of it is trying to identify the pain points if it's a new client. And if it's an existing client, it's all part of being an integral part of their team, if you will, in understanding their business. Yeah. Thinking about the firm in general, and if you're comfortable with sharing this, perhaps you could give us an idea of what proportion of the firm's revenue today comes from, shall we say, those forward-looking consulting advisory services compared with the somewhat backwards-looking uh, tax compliance account preparation services? You know, without getting into specifics, I would, I would generally say not enough comes from the consulting. Um, we're moving in that direction. Those are, you know, those are obviously your, your higher margin services and your, your, uh, the, the things that you can value bill. And there's always going to be the, those core services that we provide. But as we go forward, we're looking for more of the, the higher margin, the consulting, the advisory services that, that where we can partner with the client and bring more to the table for them. So it's moving in the right direction, um, but it's a, it's a process, you know, as it is for the whole industry, I think. Yes. Well, I think, I think that's, that's clear. I think it's uh, those who accelerate that will kind of get ahead of the curve and probably win more business. And those who lag behind will probably not be as successful and maybe suffer as the compliance aspect becomes more and more of a commodity. Agreed. Um, now, um, I see you also have some clients who outsource their entire accounting department to LBBW. It's pretty impressive. How does that work? Um, perhaps you could, there's, I believe there's a client, uh, you've got a client example uh, of, how, uh, of how that works. Well, I, I, what we found is um, that a lot of clients have internal accounting that for whatever reason isn't you know, as we've mentioned before, isn't providing accurate or timely information. And it gives us, there's a chance for that client to either replace that bookkeeper that's underperforming or move that bookkeeper who maybe doesn't even have a real background in bookkeeping, is just kind of fell into that position with someone from our firm who in maybe 10 hours a month can do the work that that bookkeeper was doing, you know, on a day in day out basis with more accurate results, accurate financials that they can use to measure their business success and take with and do it probably cheaper than the what they were actually spending on a full-time employee. Right. From there, it dovetails into those monthly or quarterly meetings, which we almost view as like a CFO service, where yes. not not every company needs a four, uh, a forty hour a week CFO. You know, you have yes. smaller businesses, mid sized businesses that the the people who run them they do what they do and they're great at it, but they're not financial people, and they need that that periodic touch from us to sit down, talk financials, maybe educate them a little as far as, you know, as much as they would like to know about, about that side of things, but to keep them on track with that and let them keep their focus where it should be while we focus on the other side of things. So that kind of the, the accounting services bookkeeping kind of dovetails right often into the CFO service. Yeah, no, I, I see how that works. Just switching back to uh, the advisory side, um, which advisory service services have, have you found to be most popular? Um, one of, the, one of the, the services I think that has been underserved in 
not uh, I guess underserved might be might be an accurate term, but it's also going to just continue to grow. I mean, we've all seen the statistics on the number of baby boomers that are retiring. I think it's like 10,000 a day for like the next 15 years. A lot of those businesses out in, out in our markets are owned by baby boomers and the consulting services that they need at this stage of the, that business cycle is, are most likely they need to start thinking about an exit or a succession plan. Um, if, if it's a family owned business, they need to be aware. They may assume that the kids want to jump in and take over the business, but that's not always the case. Like very few, I think a 20 some percent of family owned businesses actually succeed to the next generation. Um, so I think the consulting side that we provide is most beneficial right now and should be going forward is that succession planning um, and post-succession planning services for, for the business owners. Yeah. Uh, and as all clients have different needs, how do, you, how do you actually know which advisory service a specific client needs? Is, is it more they raise their hand, or is it more the interrogative, uh, investigative, diagnostic nature of your practice that, that brings those things out? I mean, it really, it really should fall to us to be proactive and recognize the, those issues. Um, there, of course, there are times when something comes up that the client that we may not be aware of, and the client does, as you said, raise their hand. Hopefully, hopefully we're ahead of the game and we see those issues before that hand goes up. Because if the hand goes up, then maybe maybe we haven't quite done our job or been as involved as as we would like to be with the business. Um, and part of being proactive with issues is being able to stay out in front of them and address them before they become problems. If the client has to raise their hand, unfortunately, it, it may already be a problem. And at that point, we're just being reactive and trying to mitigate rather than being uh, proactive and planning for them. So, so I, I would say point, definitely up front. Definitely, yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so as we, as we uh, recognize, I think, that your firm is, is clearly showing how different it can be to be a CPA, I suspect your employees have to be, have a, a different mindset, perhaps a bit more entrepreneurial. How do you find employees with the appropriate mindset? You know, it, it's interesting. The recruiting process is... We, we offer a really good uh, work-life balance. Um, so everybody has their, their busy season, and that is what it is. But outside of busy season, for example, I think from Memorial Day to Labor Day in the summer, half the office is off every other Friday. So I, we, we have a generous vacation policy, a generous additional days off policy. Um, you know, it's just, it's a very friendly atmosphere. We do a lot of uh, activities outside of the office together. Um, very open door policy um, with the partners and the managers. And we kind of, we'd like to pride ourselves on that we're a teaching firm. It's, it's you, accountants often have to fight that temptation to just fix it and get it done with. I can do it faster than somebody else, so I'll just do it and be done with it. But we need that next generation to learn and be able to, if we teach them now, they can do it going forward. And it's one less thing that's on my plate. Um, finding experienced talent when we, we almost never lose someone to another accounting firm. It's been years since we've lost someone to another accounting firm in town, which is kind of unheard of. We've lost a few people because they've moved away, but um, people stay with us. We have, I think, four or five people that are 25 years plus outside of the partner group 
that I've been with the firm for over 25 years. Um, so it's, it's a place that once people come, they stay. And we try to impart that, you know, that story, if you will, to potential recruits. That's uh, very impressive. The, uh, very impressive indeed. Kind of changing tack slightly. Um, as we come towards the year end, um, what's one thing or one area that you wish the firm had done better and you hope to improve for 2017? Um, one thing I, th- you know, I think we can do better, recruiting is always a challenge. And I don't know, some of that is out of our hands because I think when people when people leave after three or four years, if they're looking to leave a, a, a position in public accounting, they're typically moving either into private practice or they're going to stay where they are and continue moving up. So it's, it's difficult to find people that are willing to move laterally um, to another firm. Although we do, with the stage that our, our firm is in and the succession planning, it is a very unique opportunity to come in as, at a, like a manager level because there's you're, you automatically become part of the succession plan. Um, another thing I think we could do better is it's I think the industry as a whole tends to undervalue the services that we provide our clients and just to give you an example, if a client calls me today with a, with a question that I spend, say, three or four hours on, give them, come up with the answer, get back to them, and I bill them for those three or four hours. If another client happens to call me tomorrow with the exact same question, the temptation is to give them that answer because it's right off the top of my head, and now I bill them for a fraction of the hour, but we need to step back and, and understand that that service I provided uh, the original client is just as valuable to the second client, and that's when you have opportunities to value bill. And you know, it it's uh, it's something that a mind it's a mindset that I think the industry as a whole needs to embrace and understand the value of what we are bringing to the table. No, I, I completely agree. Um, and actually, as the, the pace of change in our industry is accelerating, certainly going at warp speed to compare, compared to when I first became a chartered accountant many years ago, change makes some people nervous. Others embrace change as an opportunity. As you look forward, where do you see the opportunities? I, th- I think a lot of the opportunities are in – you have to – move the the practice into that advisory consulting role. Um, the the compliance, whether it be tax or, or financial, is always going to be there, I think. But especially on the tax side, I, I think the future is, is going to be more and more automated. You already have uh, a lot of tax products out there that use um, where you just scan the documents in and they populate right into the software and it becomes more of just a review function than a preparation function. Um, so I think going forward, the, the industry needs to move, embrace that consultant role, or we're going to be left behind or left trying to compete in in what is becoming a commodity in the market and just coming down to who can – it's hard to explain to a client or tell a client that I can do their tax return better, and that's why they should pay me more to do it. Um, to them, it's just a tax return. The, um, yeah. So it's a tough argument to have. So I think you don't want to be in that space where you're, you're just battling on price because no one wins. No, in the in the value based billing world, if you can bring a benefit of a hundred thousand dollars to a client, then the size of your bill is not really the first thing on their mind. I completely agree. So, if you could go back twenty years, Chris, and give yourself one piece of advice, what might that advice be? <sighs> well, that's that's a great question. Um, you know, I 
I think it would be to just look, always be looking forward at the don't you can't always fall in love with the with the newest technology but you have to be open to seeing the benefits that new technology can bring to both the firm and and your clients um any business that that fails to evolve is is not going to survive and i think accountants by nature tend to look at what we've always done and continue to, you know, it's always worked. We've always billed hourly or this is the service that they want from us. They don't want us to bother them with planning ideas or something like that, but we need to evolve in the same way that technology evolves. And part of that is embracing technology. Um, it can make us more efficient. It can make our clients' lives easier. Um, and I think you know, if if I look back 20 years, I would I would probably tell myself, always be looking forward technology-wise. Okay, very good. Well, unfortunately, the clock's telling me that our time's just about up, Chris. Is there anything you'd like to add that I didn't ask you about? You know, I I think we've had a, a great conversation. Um, one thing that I, I wouldn't mind adding, if you don't mind, is is an area that we think is an interesting area, very very interesting for our firm, and something that's a little bit outside of the box from what accountants traditionally think of. Um, we're looking at the taking our accounting services product and actually working with other accounting firms. And what I mean by that is, Let's take the nonprofit sector, for example. Um, we do a, a lot of nonprofit audits, and just by their nature, they may not have the best bookkeeping. They may not be able to afford it in-house. So the audits become quite involved in trying to get their accounting up to snuff. And our, our approach on, the, on, on this is going to be to work with other accounting firms where they identify their problem audits where they could use, where they want their client to have better internal accounting. That's where we come in. They, the other accounting firm at the end of the year gets uh, pristine internal financials. They have a actual accountant they can speak to if they have questions, that being us. And their audit should go so much smoother, so they should be able to increase their realization. Um, it's business for us. We don't cross paths in the sense that the current auditor, they can't do the services that we're asking uh, the introduction for, and we agree not to pursue the audit no matter what. So it's an interesting. Typically, we're we think you know we're always in competition with each other, but we think there's a niche there to actually work with other accounting firms, and if they buy into that that introduction from their current accountant, saying telling the client you need to talk to LVBW, is we go in with a big gold star next to our name. I think. No, that's a, that's, that's a great thought, especially you could almost have, I, I suspect, um, industry specialization in that field as well. Um, absolutely. You could be extra efficient internally. Yes, absolutely. Very interesting, very interesting. Well, thank you, Chris. I'd like to thank Chris Billman, Senior Tax Manager at Logan Valenti, Bookbinder and Weintraub, for being so generous with his time today. Thank you, Chris. No, thank you, Ian. Now, if people want to learn more about you or LVBW, what's the best way for them to do so? Um, I would probably suggest they go to our website, which is uh, www.lvbwcpa.com. And you can find my bio on there as well as uh, the rest of the firm. And the website's going to be going under uh, a nice revamp in the near future. Um, but uh, it, uh, that's probably the best way to get a hold of us and see what, what we can do for you.
Could you repeat your website address again, please? www.lvbwcpa.com. Thank you, Chris. Okay, there you have it. This is Ian Wellam saying goodbye for now. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time on the Accounting Success Podcast.